Today's sermon text comes from 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 16. We'll read the whole of chapter 2 to situate our text. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, to ashes he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about the matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Baor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice, and restrain the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the, the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them to never have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> I love you. I'd like to start by answering two questions that no one has asked yet. If after this message, you have one of the following questions. Did you really have to? Or, are you really that childish? The answers are, yes, I had to, and yes, I am. You will understand exactly what I mean after I reread the text. <clears throat> Since we are not doing a sermon series in Second Peter, I'm going to spend a bit of time giving you some context. In this case, it's not just the usual cultural and historical context that I often try to give, but also some context of the book itself. First, we should note chapter 1, verses 12 through 15, that Peter is nearing the end of his life. Church history and tradition place Peter's execution as under the reign of Nero, very close to the time of Paul's execution. This places the writing of this letter probably close to 65 to 67 AD. Chapter 3, verse 1 refers to this as the second letter, letter that Peter has sent to these readers. This is likely, though not for sure, a reference to 1 Peter. However, this is not entirely for sure, and we cannot make a judgment on this based on the order and label of the letters in our Bibles. 
For example, I believe it is 2 Thessalonians that was actually written before 1 Thessalonians. There are, there are very glaring similarities between 2 Peter and Jude. Most scholars believe Peter borrowed text from Jude and expounded upon it. While it is possible that Jude <coughs> borrowed from Peter, or that they both borrowed from a similar source, there is almost no doubt that there is some level of sharing between 2 Peter and Jude. This, however, should not be taken as undermining the authority or authentication of 2 Peter, or Jude for that matter, as God-inspired scripture. Take, for example, that Matthew most likely borrowed from Mark. Church history has it that Mark wrote, from, wrote his gospel as dictated by Peter, who was closer to Christ than Matthew and might have had better inside information. Further, if a good and reliable rec recording of the life of Christ is already in existence, why reinvent the wheel? Use what great resources already exist and add to them as necessary. Point being, one writer borrowing from another does not undermine the authority or canonicity of the text. It is still fully authoritative as scripture, as the written and inspired word of God. At this point, Peter has access to at least some of Paul's letters, which he holds as the same level of authority as Scripture, chapter 3, verse 16. Keep in mind at this point that Scripture to them generally referred to the First Testament. Peter, referring to Paul, says he writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. I want to note the emphasis on the word other, meaning he is referring to Paul's writings as scripture and putting it in the same category as the First Testament, most likely what he is referring to as the other scripture, or other scriptures. As a side note, if you're ever reading something the Apostle Paul wrote and you do not quite understand it or it isn't clear, be encouraged. Even another apostle who himself wrote scripture, inspired by the Holy Scripture, penned scripture himself, said, Paul's words can be very hard to understand. In regard to the text of 2 Peter itself, aside from the introduction and conclusions, there are three primary sections. The first section is the last half of chapter 1, and affirms the message of Peter and the true apostles while affirming the absolute supremacy of Scripture. Please briefly note verses 17 through 19. This, uh, just as a note of giving credit where it's due, I got this little lesson from Chaplain Ross Haverhalls, who learned it from uh, Pastor Kevin from First Prez. In verses 17 through 19, Peter recounts his witnessing of the transfiguration, but affirms that even above his witnessing of the transfiguration, the prophetic word they have received is even more sure, which fits right in the context of the following verses, affirming that scripture is written through men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoken from God. The third section, starting at verse 1 of chapter 3, warns against those who would disregard or twist the prophecies of scripture. We have already looked at the reference to those who would twist Paul's words in regard to that subject. The middle section, the one we will be studying a portion of, focuses on those who would entirely disregard scripture and teach their own doctrines and falsehoods. These are not people who misunderstand or twist scripture through their ignorance. They are not even people who might knowingly twist scripture, people who at least acknowledge Christ with their lips, even if they are intentionally deceiving. These are people who full-blown deny the master, verse 2, and people who flaunt their disregard for the rule of law, in this case, the rule of God's law. With this, we are able to find our two primary themes that run through 2 Peter. The supremacy, power, and reliability of Scripture, and the warning against those who would go against God. This brings us to our text for today. When Pastor Ivan opened up these weeks for preaching, he gave us the go-ahead to preach on whatever we have always wanted to preach on. <clears throat> I disclosed to him my intent to preach on this from this version. He knew full well, I want to say that beforehand. And he laughed at it, which means either A, he approved of it, or B, thought I was kidding and is going to be in for a real surprise when he comes back. He wanted us to find that text that has always nagged us up to the present, or nagged at us to present. 
As I thought and thought, only one text came to mind centered around a specific verse. Which brings me back to, did you have to? Yes, yes I did. And are you really that childish? Unfortunately, I am. Much like the last time, by the time you've heard this sermon, you will have heard the word of God four times. You've already heard it once, thanks to a reader, thank you, who has read several verses before and after a selected passage for the purpose of context. I will read the whole text again, including the extra verses for context, but for the sermon, I will only reread the verses I am preaching on. But before we get into that, let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for these people who are here. I thank you for the gathering. Father, I thank you for the fellowship we are able to have with each other by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, that by the Holy Spirit we are able to be in union as one body, worshiping you. Father, I thank you that by the Holy Spirit we're able to shake hands, we're able to enjoy each other's company, enjoy each other's presence. Father, I thank you for every person here. I thank you for my brothers and sisters who are here to worship you. It is such a beautiful and wonderful thing, Lord, that even among here, which is mostly, mostly Swedish Baptist people, that there are so many differences among us, and yet all that goes aside for the sake of worshiping our Lord Jesus Christ that that is what is first and foremost the important thing here. So, Father, I pray that this offering and this message be acceptable to you. I pray that it cuts to our hearts and our minds, that we learn, that we grow, that we become more shaped to the image of your Son. We pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> I will be reading from the Revised Standard Version. But false prophets also arose among the people. Just as there will be false teachers among you, you will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their licentiousness, and because of them the way of truth will be reviled. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. From of old their condemnation has not been idle, and their destruction has not been asleep. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to the pits of nether gloom to be kept until the judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven other persons, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, and made them an example to those who were to be ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the licentiousness of the wicked, for by what that righteous man saw and heard as he lived among them, he was vexed in his righteous soul day after day with their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they are not afraid to revile the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a reviling judgment upon them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct born to be caught and killed, reviling in matters of which they're ignorant, will be destroyed in the same destruction with them. Suffering wrong for their wrongdoing, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their dissipation. Carousing with you, they have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A dumb ass spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. There are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the nether gloom of darkness has been reserved. For uttering loud boasts of folly, they entice with licentiousness passions of the flesh of men who have barely escaped from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a man, to that he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overpowered, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them to have never have known the way of righteousness 
than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog turns back to his own vomit and a sow is washed only to wallow in the mire. I would remind you of our two running themes, which I will summarize as the supremacy of scripture and the warning of those, warning against those who would go against God. This passage focuses primarily on those who would go against God. However, the underlying and unspoken theme, or antithesis, if you will, that undergirds this passage is that we should look back to scripture. The primary literary tools Peter will use in this text is to utilize contrasts and comparisons, and Peter uses countless allusions to the First Testament throughout the entire letter. Verses 4 through 10a. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of nether bloom to be kept until judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven other persons, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the licentiousness of the wicked, for by what that righteous man saw and heard as he lived among them, he was vexed to his, in his righteous soul day after day with their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from the trial and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. This portion appears to somewhat shy away from one of our themes and that it refers primarily to those who did not have any written word that we know of. This was almost entirely pre-flood, with the exception of Abraham and Lot. And even there, under the belief that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, no biblical text had been written yet. This does not mean that they did not have a law for them to follow at this point. Clearly, there were those who still understood righteousness, even if it was but a few. Peter recounts the history of those who disregarded God starting back to the earliest points in creation with the fall of angels who rebelled. He recounts the flood account as well as Sodom and Gomorrah to include the mercy shown to Lot. Though few would look to the account of Lot in Genesis and see a righteous man. What must be recognized is that when the angels arrived, Lot sought to protect them from the men of the city. Even in showing the slightest semblance of righteousness, what might be translated to us as following God's word. Lot was shown mercy mercy, while those who did not faced utter destruction. Verses 10b through 11. Bold and willful they are, not afraid to revile the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce reviling judgment upon them before the Lord. We see our first stark contrast. I want you first to consider the description of the angels as we have seen throughout Scripture. Revelation, for example, portrays angels as so majestic and beautiful that even the Apostle John thought they were God himself. Daniel 10, 5-6 gives a description of angels having a face like lightning, eyes like flaming torches, arms and legs that gleam like burnished bronze, and a voice that sounds like a multitude. Even their description sounds very similar to the glory and beauty of Christ himself as described in Revelation. These are beings that cause awe with their beauty and majesty. They are beyond description. Yet those who stand against God are so ultimately and absolutely corrupt that they revile and disdain these angelic beings. The verbiage is not entirely clear if the revilers are referring to wicked people or fallen angels who are mentioned in this passage. However, the following verses suggest that these are fallen angels who went against God and now sneer at his majesty as demonstrated through his creation. Nonetheless, even in their beauty and majesty, the angels recognize that judgment is for God and not for them. They demonstrate proper humility and righteousness, not in that they are lesser compared to people or fallen angels, but that they reserve for God what belongs to God alone. Verses 12 through 14. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and killed, reviling in matters of which they are ignorant, will be destroyed in the same destruction with them, suffering wrong for the wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their dissipation, carousing with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. 
They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. The contrasting word, but these, refers to the humans and sounds like it is making the distinction of the humans from the fallen angels in the previous versions. verses. Yet their ending will ultimately be the same, suffering and condemnation. What is so striking about this passage is that it says they revel in the daytime. In other words, they don't even try to hide their sins. They don't even try to hide their wickedness. They do it right out there in the open in the public for all the world to see. They don't even care. Well, at least some people recognize their wickedness and attempt to do so in secret. These people are either proud of their wickedness or do not think what they are doing is evil. In the latter regard, we should recall the warning of Isaiah. Isaiah 5.20 warns, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. No doubt Peter had this passage in mind as he warned of those who publicly perform acts of wickedness. The verbiage and context suggests something to the effect that these people seek to confuse and to deceive, yet they mingle among us with wicked desires, attempting to implant themselves within us. This, by context, leads directly into Peter's next comparison. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, was verses 15 through 16. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A dumb ass spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Forsaking the right way is a key phrase. These people who were once pursuing the correct path. This is supported in other passages in 2 Peter, as well as verses 21 through 22. Yet they abandoned the right way and followed the way that brought personal gain. Balaam, if you recall, suggested to Balak that they should intermarry and interbreed with the Israelites of the Exodus. This occurred in Numbers. Knowing this was against the commandments they had heard from God. Balaam knew this would cause disfavor from God for the people. But he made the suggestion and did so because of the gain he would receive from helping Balak. They sought to bring sin among the people of God, knowing it would undermine every work being done within Israel, much like these people today do so within the church. Yet here we see another contrast. Earlier, it was a reviling of fallen angels compared to the sober humility of angels. But here we saw that people turned to animalistic behaviors based on instinct and carnal desire. Yet it was an instinct-based animal that rebuked the prophet. We must now recognize that it is turning to the word of God that prevents people from succumbing to the deceit of someone like Balaam. Our applications are as follows. Reading again verses 4 through 11. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of nethered loom to be kept until judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven other persons when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the licentiousness of the wicked, for by what that righteous man saw and heard as he lived among them, he was vexed in his righteous soul day after day with their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial and keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they are not afraid to revile the glorious ones, Whereas angels, although greater in might and power, do not pronounce reviling, pronounce reviling judgment upon them before the Lord. As mentioned before, to our knowledge, these people did not have the written word of God to guide them. Let us not be mistaken, however. Romans 1 9 and following remind us. For what can be known about God, excuse me, 119 and following remind us. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. God made himself evident in everything. Even those who have never seen a Bible or never read the Bible can see the workings of God in creation. Let me tell you a phrase that has never been spoken. Why, when I realized there was in fact no God and no afterlife, it empowered me to stop drinking and stop beating my wife. 
Yet the countless examples that we have of people who have overcome sin, overcome addiction, overcome sexual immorality, overcome violence, the countless examples we have of people who have overcome sin by the word of God absolutely abound. The evidence of the gospel is present within those who worship the risen Lord. While God made himself apparent to people, we can even see it in Balaam, who had a direct encounter with God, who had all the ability in the world to prevent, present the truth to Balak and the Moabite people, yet he chose otherwise, and he fell for his folly. Verses 12 through 14. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and killed, reviling in matters of which they are ignorant, will be destroyed in the same destruction with them, suffering wrong for the wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their dissipation, carousing with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. I would ask you, how much of this do we currently see in this nation, in this modern society? As non-biblical worldviews persist in modern society, we can recognize, first of all, that as the desire of, un, of the ungodly to relegate humans back to the category of irrational animals and creatures of instinct. Humans are placed in the category of sharing a common ancestor of apes and the product of nothing but chance evolution. And yet, because a person will not consistently behave different than what he believes himself to be, we continue to see this within humanity and the non-biblical people, <clears throat> that within humanity and within non-biblical people point to animal life to support their ideas. How do we promote homosexuality? We see the behavior in the animal kingdom. 10% of animals do this. How do we support hypersexuality and promiscuity? We point to the animal kingdom. After all, they say, we're just nothing but mammals. It could be a song. Yet we have a protection from falsehood and from succumbing to messages that tickle our ears and appeal to our, our carnal nature. We have the Holy Spirit within us and the power of the Word of God. The Word of God tells us we are more than just animals. We are in unique creations of our Father. The Word of God tells us we do not need to revert back to in instinct, but we can stand on faith and hope. The Word of God has the power to correct falsehood, destroy heresy, and fight fear. Having discussed the animalistic tendencies of those who would deny the word of God, there are two points that starkly stand out. They revile in matters of which they are ignorant, and they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. I know that after a summer of studying apologetics with these senior high Sunday school students, and after critically evaluating the articles written by staunch atheists in the Free Inquiry magazine, these students can attest that this could not be more true. People in their hatred of godliness will paint absurd pictures of God, blatantly misrepresent Christian positions, and pull scripture entirely out of context to attempt to score a point against Christianity. As earlier discussed, they revert to animalistic nature in states of adultery and debauchery, and they do so in broad daylight. They have no shame, no fear, and any sense of moral compass is all but gone. Sadly, as Protestant liberalism grows and seeker sensitivity abounds, this type of thinking has invaded the Christian church. This points to the huge importance of good theology and the huge importance of studying the word of God. These people are in grave theological error. Immorality is the product of the theological error. Both are gravely serious. Whether atheists or heretics within the church, their theological error contributed to the belief that they need not worry about judgment, therefore they revert to lives of ungodliness. The text says very clearly that their fate will be utter destruction and to be accursed. In most of biblical language, accursed refers to condemnation. It refers to hell. This is the underlying and spoken theme of this passage. It, <clears throat> the condemnation waiting for those who reject godliness. Yet there is the other important note. They are carousing among us. They are seeking to lead us astray and trick us with false doctrine. But what is the clearly communicated statement of the first portion of 2 Peter that is unspoken here? Let us look briefly to Acts 
the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. It is not enough to simply receive an occasional message on Sundays. We need to be looking to the word of God daily, as the word of God has the power to correct falsehood and correct behavior. The word of God has the power to even transform the hearts and minds of the most animalistic of the ungodly, bringing salvation from the destruction these people are headed to that we were all once heading to ourselves. The word of God has the power to correct theological error and to give us proper understanding of who God is and how we relate to him. Verses 15 through 16 Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A dumbass spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Let's get a little context of who Balaam was, just as a reminder, turning to Numbers 22, verses 21 through 33. So Balaam rose in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. But God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as, a, as his adversary. Now he was riding on the ass, and his, and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, and the ass turned aside out of the road and went into the field. And Balaam struck the ass to turn her into the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in the narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on either side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she brushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall, so he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or to the left. When the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he struck the ass with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the ass, Because you have made sport of me. I wish I had a sword in my hand, for then I would kill you. And the ass said to Balaam, Am I not your ass upon which you have ridden all your life long to this day? Was I ever accustomed to do so to you? And he said, No. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his, with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed his head and fell on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Why have you struck your ass these three times? Behold, I have come forth to withstand you, because your way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me and turned aside before me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely just now I would have slain you. And let her live. <clears throat> As mentioned, the use of contrast here points out that in verse 12, these false teachers are portrayed as becoming like irrational animals and creatures of instinct. Yet it is an irrational animal and creature of instinct that, by a miracle of God, was able to correct the prophet's madness. It was the animal that recognized the danger and the animal that recognized the results of going against God. I'm reminded of how I was mentally after returning from the Middle East. For a long time, I was quite high strung, and my mind raced a mile a minute all the time. While many people would relax in silence, for me it was extremely nerve-wracking. While it wasn't quite to this extent, it was almost as if, if there were silence, it meant something was brewing and waiting to happen. If I knew there should be something going on, as if I... It was as if I knew there should be something going on, so my attentiveness perked up. That said, I could not sit in the car without the radio on and was usually blaring loud music. I was resorting to a more animalistic way of thinking. And then it came from the most unlikely of sources. For whatever reason, I was discussing this with an inmate in the chapel. The inmate was consistently a knucklehead and pretty consistently getting in trouble for stupid things. Yet here he was studying scripture, and he said that when he struggled with such things, he remembered Psalm 
be still and know I am God. He mentioned in the, that in the stillness and the quiet, God is God. There's no need for hypervigilance. A dumbass spoke with a human voice and silenced a correctional officer's madness. Yet what he spoke was speaking with the power of the word of God to overcome all falseness and animalistic thinking. Yet aside from our experiences and what we can observe, we have this word made more sure. That no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Because no prophecy ever came by the impulse of man. But men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. We have the blessing of his written word, the word that cuts the soul, leaves to the heart, shatters stone, and builds anew. The message of the word of God, which brings salvation, guards against falsehood, brings false teaching to light, and reveals truth. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we give you great thanks that you have given us your word and that by it you continue to draw us back to yourself. You continue to correct us. You continue to convict us of our sin, Father. And we pray that you would, would carry this on, that, that we would, uh, by your strength, continue in your word, continue uh, to profit from what you have recorded and preserved for us, uh, that this week would be a week of uh, time spent in your word and good fruit flowing from that. We give you thanks for this word, this encouragement to seek you. Help us now as we go from here to live according to your word and by the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, for Jesus in his name. Amen. Service is ended.